I forgot about that. I wasn't even putting two to two together. That makes a lot of sense now. It's the, div the divine mind of uh, Ahura Mazda, which Zarathustra and the Gatha says that, you know, the mind of Ahura Mazda uh, exploded into myriad sparks of light and manifested the cosmic order, you know, in the Gatha. So Christianity, with all these maguses and magoys, this is sort that's of... That's another thing. It's a, that's a mag it's a sort of a, a, a descendant, a branch off of this magi zoroastrian exactly look simon magus there's a reason he's called mate whether Litwell likes to call him magus or not but there's a reason he was called that yeah he was called magus because he was a magi he was a member of the order of the magi and one of the first christian calls to be in rome like during the time of saint linus who's the supposedly the guy who was anointed by peter we're talking like the first century these simonians who were worshiping simon magus apparently According to Irenaeus and Hippolytus, so who knows how accurate it is, but let's say let's take them at their word value. Then that means the first Christians to show up in Rome were Magi. And this whole notion that some people, some scholars, Western, let, let's just, I'm gonna I was gonna use an epithet, but I'll just pass over that. Uh, a lot of Western scholars try to dismiss uh, the significance of this term magus um, by saying, well, you know it just meant a practitioner of magic or alchemy or whatever no no look the greeks who brought magic to greece were accused of medism there was a crime in greece called medism really coming from the medes the median people one of the branch four branches of the ancient iranians the medes are closest to today's kurds and uh so and they ruled iran before the Persians. The Persians overtook the Medes and incorporated them into the Persian Empire. So the Medes were the first Iranians that the Greeks had encountered, and the Magi are the priests or wise men of the Medes. And Magi, wise men of the Medes, people practicing magic in Greece, and also the revolutionary pre-Socratic philosophers were accused of Medism meaning bringing foreign Iranian, Iranian specifically ideas to Greece in a way that's considered treasonous. Like, you know, the McCarthy hearings in America where they're all calling these guys commies and Russian agents and whatever. Right? Well, it's like Socrates' trial. He gets, he gets executed for importing foreign deities. No one even knows what those are. His teacher, Socrates' teacher, Aspasia, I mean, she wasn't, like I said, the guy was a bum. So he, she wasn't his teacher in any formal sense, but there was this older woman that he hung out with and he was very influenced by her, Aspasia, and she was a uh, uh, mistress of uh, Pericles, I believe. Uh, and anyway, she was accused of Medism. She was one of these people who actually was charged with Medism. Wow. So, so it's not true that Magus just meant magician. Magus had a very culturally specific connotation and it meant those people associated with that Iranian shit over there. That I, I've actually heard someone else tell me exactly what you just said is not. Yeah. Other people very, very entrenched in this type of uh, area. That that's a, it was it became a slang term, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like you're a magi, but really that just could, that can mean a million things. Right. You know, it's like gnostic. Like, what's a gnostic? I don't know. It's Valentine. Yeah, but, but my point is, it, it had a culturally specific association. Right. And so, aside from the fact that you got Simon Magus talking about cosmic fire and the seventh power as the divine intellect, God's power of thought, which you don't find even in Heraclitus. You know, the guys identified as a Magi, you know, as, as a member of the, the Magian order. Uh, so, yeah, so you got this uh, association of Simon Magus with Zarathustra. And then to go back to the Carpocratians, okay, this is something I think your, your viewers may not be familiar with, and it's tremendously significant. So the Carpocratians were accused of having all these basically ecstatic orgies and you know, that they were uh, libertines who believed in not just relinquishing private property, but in overcoming the, uh, the notion of, um, the notion of uh, property that underlies monogamous marriage. In other words, holding other people as property, right? Being able to overcome the, the aspects of the human ego that uh, express themselves in greed and avaricious behavior. Uh, and so 
they were radical communists who right. um, didn't only want to abolish private property. They uh, thought that uh, love was somehow uh, diminished or constrained by monogamous marriage and its association with property holding and the whole patriarchal economic system of the time. And interestingly enough, there is a Gnostic sect in Iran who has exactly this same teaching called the Mazdakites. And these Mazdakites claimed to be the true heirs to the teaching of Zarathustra. They thought that the Sasanid Persian Empire, the second Persian Empire, there are three Iranian empires in antiquity, the, the Achaemenid Empire, the Parthian Empire, and the Sassanid Empire, but the Parthians were Scythians. They were not Persians. So the second Persian Empire is the Sassanid Persian Empire from about 200 AD to 650, when they were conquered by Islam, 650 AD. And during the Sassanid Persian Empire, these Mazdakites, again, Mazda means wisdom, right? right. So these Mazdakites, they argued that the Sassanid priesthood had set up an orthodoxy that was a total perversion of the teachings of Zarathustra. And they represented the true teachings of Zarathustra. And interestingly enough, they're advocating communism, the abolishing of private property, right? But then also free love and a transcendence of monogamous marriage uh, and basically, you know, open, you know, uh, amorous relationships between men and women and so forth, which was for them also a way of breaking up harems and destroying aristocratic bloodlines, right? Destroying the landed feudal aristocracy. And although the, okay, so now the Mazdakites, as, as radical as this teaching seems, the Mazdakites were able to seize control of the Sassanid Persian Empire for no less than 30 years. In the early 500s, 505 to 520s, 530 AD, through um, a court uh, minister called Mazdak, this movement which was subsequently named after him, but had an older name, I'll come to in a moment, this movement seized control of the Persian state. There was a king who, uh, uh, Kavad, who supposedly was sympathetic to it, and uh, he basically let, have Ma let Mazdak have free reign, and they took over the government, and they created a, I mean, insane, radical, Gnostic, communist society in Iran for 30 years. Wow. Okay. Before they were finally, of course, you can imagine how the story ended. They were all massacred. It's right, it's right before Islam comes around. Right. Exactly. Well, the trauma of this incident is, I think, in large part, what rendered the Persian Empire vulnerable to being conquered by Islam. There had been an internal revolution and civil war before the Arabs came in and made short work of the. That's why the Persian Empire was so vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, they had basically turned on themselves first. Makes a lot of sense. But here's my point, is that if you look in the her heresi heresiological texts about the Mazdakites, they all say that this movement was already hundreds of years old when it took control of the state, which kind of makes sense. I mean, for it to have become that powerful and entrenched that it could actually topple the government, it would take a long time, right, to build that kind of following throughout the whole of the Persian Empire. And they say the movement actually goes back to at least 200 AD. And when are we dealing with the Carpocration order? About 100, about 50 to, 50 to 100 years earlier, right. right? And so these are very close in historical time frame. And- Oh, and not to mention the writings that are found from Nag Hammadi and other places in Egypt, like Alexandria, that are related to movements such as the Carpocrations and other movements, mostly in Egypt, Christianity, they, they're Zoroaster and his uh, and his grandfather. Um, Zos, was it what's his name? Zosimos, I think it is. Yes. But yeah, there's there. It's not even this is not even like hidden or like through philosophy is through philosophy. They're literally reading and, and translating in Coptic the writings of Zoroaster and his grandfather. Right. And so they say this movement goes back to like at least 200 AD, um, and it comes from uh, the the state of Iran, the province of Iran from which the Persian Empire gets its name, 
namely Persis, Parsa. Right. Okay? And uh, which is around where Shiraz is today. It's where Persepolis, the ruins of Persepolis are. It's where the city of Shiraz is, where, you know, the Shiraz wine comes from and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, they say the guy who founded this movement, which was originally called Doros Dinan, or the Partisans of Justice. Remember that text, the Carpocration text on justice? Yeah. Uh, social justice. So it was called the Movement of the Just. Uh, and its founder was a guy called Zarthusht, hmm. which is a Middle Persian Zarathustra. So we have the second Zarathustra, the second Zoroaster, preaching this doctrine, which is identical to the Carpocration doctrine. And then the Carpocratians are setting up statues of Pythagoras and of Plato, who's influenced by Pythagoras and by Heraclitus, both of whom were Persian agents. And not incidentally, I neglected to mention that the Magi attended Plato's funeral. Oh, that's right. That's a big um, They came from Iran. They attended Plato's funeral, and they said he was one of our own. They attended in the capacity of, like, honoring a brother. That's a big deal. Oh, Zostrianos. That's the guy's name. Is that really his grandfather, Zor Zoroaster's grandfather? I don't think so, but I think okay. that it's very significant that the Gnostics wanted to say that. That's what I'm saying. They're attributing, the, even if they're making this up. It's a pedigree they want to establish for themselves. It shows you how entrenched, how interested, and how valuable yeah. Zoroastrian ideas were to the Gnostic movements in Egypt. The Coptics. Yeah. Coptic Christian, that's what they were. Absolutely. Um, and then, look... Uh, I mean, we've gone for a long time, but we yeah. can't we can't neglect Mani, right? We can't neglect. Oh, oh Mani. yeah, I'm so glad Mani. you brought that up. So many streams of Gnostic thought come from out of Mani um, and Manichaeism, uh, like for example, uh, the Bogomil movement of uh, southeastern Europe, uh, mainly associated with Bulgaria, but there's a lot of scholarship that says that it came from Constantinople originally. Interesting. Um, so the Bogomil movement, uh, and then you've got the Cathars in the Occitan region, which stretched from mainly southern France into part of Italy and part of Spain on the Mediterranean. The Cathar movement and the Bogomil movement were both branded by the inquisitors of the Catholic Church as, quote, Manichees, unquote. Yeah. Okay. So the, according to the Catholic Church, against the Manichees was the reputation. The yeah. According to the Catholic Church, these people were Manichaeans. Right. <laughs> what does that tell you? That tells you this is a Persian movement to the eyes of the church. In, to, in the eyes of the church, exactly. And so um, Mani, who, who was Mani? Mani was uh, a Parthian royal. He was a, remember, so I, I mentioned there was the second Iranian empire. It wasn't Persian, but it was Iranian, the Parthian empire. They were descendants of Scythians. And called himself a disciple of Jesus. Yes. And uh, so Mani was from a Parthian royal bloodline, uh, born in Mesopotamia, which, again, the capital of Iran at the, in the Parthian period was also in Mesopotamia, and um, at a city called Ctesiphon. And uh, so he's from this royal lineage, and his mother's a Christian. And so his father is a Parthian. Uh, either Zoroastrian or Mithraist, probably in, in ancestry, and his mother is a Christian. And he basically develops this doctrine that uh, intensifies the dualism latent in Zarathustra's message. So Zarathustra is not a dualist, right? I mean, the, this opposition between Sepantaminu and Engraminu is still sort of under the divine intelligence of Ahura Mazda, and it's not meant to suggest that there is on an ontological level, in other words, in the nature of reality, some kind of a split between a material world and a spiritual world. You don't find that in the Gathas. So Zarathustra is not an ontological dualist, okay, but he's got these two principles. And Mani takes these two principles of, he, by his time, it's Ormazd. It's a contraction of Ahura Mazda. Ormazd and Ahriman, contraction of Angraminu. He takes these and he radicalizes them into a, a real substantive ontological dualism. And he says there are two worlds, a material world governed by Ahriman and a spiritual world like the Pleroma, that's the world of Ahura Mazda. And we are sparks of the divine that have been trapped in this material world. And we basically 
have it as our spiritual work to free this divine spark within us so that it can rejoin the light, you know, the, the realm of light uh, and transcend this realm of dark physicality. Um, and so he develops this Gnostic doctrine and various elements of his teaching fuse ideas from Zarathustra, the Gnostic Jesus, which at this time we're talking, Mani is around 200, um, 200, early 200s yeah. Uh, yeah. AD. And in fact, specifically under the reign of Shapur the Great, and this is not incidental, Shapur the Great, the most militarily successful emperor of the second Persian empire becomes the patron of Mani. Right. He becomes his patron, which is kind of bizarre. I mean, this guy, like, Shapur is like Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. He expanded the Persian Empire dramatically, and he takes Mani in. And I say it's bizarre because, you know, people think of Manichaeism as this world-denying, ascetic doctrine of, like, oh, go put, you know, put yourself in a monastic cell somewhere and uh, deny your physical impulses and try to purify your spirit and whatever. And, there's no way that this could have been Mani's actual teaching, even if he prescribed some kind of a monastic way of life for a certain class of people. Um, Shapur would never have taken in a guy like that into the court and would never have backed this guy to go on evangelical missions as far oh. afield as India and China. China. Yeah. You know, the Manichaeans, they, their legacy survived for centuries in China. Uh, a lot of Manichaean texts that we have are actually from northwestern China. And so, so Shapur is backing this guy to go on these wide travels. And what's, what's the deal here? Well, the deal is that Shapur is starting to conquer a large part of the Roman Empire. He, he's uh, famously depicted um, in the Pars province of Iran that I mentioned earlier on these stones next to Persepolis. He's depicted uh, forcing Caesar Valerian of Rome to kneel before his horse. It's a great rock carving. You can look it up. Very famous of Shapur on horseback with Caesar Valerian of Rome on his knees, looking up to Shapur under the hooves of his horse. And so Shapur is conquering large parts of the Roman Empire in the West, and he's conquering large parts of India and all the way up to the border of North uh, Western China in the East. And so Shapur is looking for a world religion. He wants to create one world religion. And he's looking at Mani as a guy who can do it for him. And so Mani takes Zarathustra and the Gnostic Jesus and Buddha. And he fuses them into one religion that includes belief in reincarnation and, you know, the Buddha of light and all these ideas you, you find that survive in Mahayana and pure land Buddhism and so forth uh, to create one world religion, a Gnostic religion. Yeah, it's very similar to the Carpocratians in that sense, where they have these three figures. Yes, and the Cathar way of life, I think, tells us a lot about what Manichaeism was like. because. It's true that you had perfecti in the Cathar religion. They call them perfecti, per perfected people, who lived a monastic life. And they were very ascetic. But these perfecti would only become perfecti when they were geezers, okay? It was old men and old women who would become perfecti. When the Cathars were younger, you know, in Occitanian culture, they were all mixed up with the troubadours who were these traveling romantic poets. And they were also clearly closely allied with the Knights Templar. Mm. And sometimes troubadours in medieval Occitan would become Cathar Perfecti later in life. And sometimes Templar Knights would become Cathar Perfecti after living lives full of, you know, brutal conquest, right? And these wars of, you know, conquest in the Middle East and so forth. So, so you got like, erotic poets who are libertines preaching basically all kinds of orgiastic, uh, you know, um, practices uh, and, and writing about them in, in these uh, romantic poems that they sing in the courts of various um, medieval ladies. And you've got these, uh, you know, military men who are certainly not pacifists for most of their lives, and they're becoming Cathar Perfecti. And so I think this shows you how Shapur uh, was able to accommodate Mani's teaching uh, because it was not this naive, overly idealistic, world-denying teaching. Uh, it had different 
classes of worshipers and it had a realistic view of human society and the laity were not expected to adhere to this kind of asceticism that you find among the perfecti. And then of course there was a the notion of reincarnation. So, you know, you had many lifetimes to perfect your soul, um, uh, which you also find in the Cathars. So the, the Manichaeans are another group of Gnostics who are deeply influenced by Zarathustra. Zarathustra is one of the three great world teachers for Mani, again, together, like I mentioned earlier, with the Gnostic Christ and with Buddha. Uh, and so another major stream of, of Gnosticism influenced by Zarathustra is this radically dualist school that we see coming from out of Manichaeism and all of its offshoots, Bogomilism, Catharism, and so forth. Yeah, that's so, that, there's so much to, there's so much that comes all back to Zoroaster. If you, you can just, it's like a bunch of lines, like tree branches that just go back to this time period. And it's a time period that's contemporary with a lot of other, you know, Isaiah, Hosea, um, you know, t you know, the Babylonians and, and uh, like, it's, it's just fascinating to think about it like that. I have a, actually have a question for you because I was thinking about this. There's a high, there was the second temple period of Judaism. They had these um, high priests that are named Harkonnes. And there's a, there's a thought that maybe they're from Harkania and they were taking in priests that like knew ancient rites that they somehow lost after being captive in Babylon for all these time. And they wanted to bring in like priests that knew what they were doing. So they brought in these Harkanian priests. Is that, what do you think about that? You said this is in the second temple period? Yeah. And by the way, this is right after Cyrus was called the Messiah, not by, oh, he's a Messiah, like Solomon. No, oh, he's Messiah. my Messiah, Messiah from the word of God himself, my Absolutely. shepherd. So that's a pretty big deal. Listen, uh, we could have a whole a whole show on this subject because I'm about to say yeah. something that's extremely incendiary in response to your question. <laughs> uh, but point being, I could back it up. By the way, if people are interested, this is the book in which I discuss Zarathustra at length. Yeah. It's quite a poem. Actually. I got a link in the description too, so people can yeah, Iranian Leviathan. And I'm, I'm pointing to it right now because I have a whole chapter on what I'm about to say, All right. uh, which is very incendiary in response to your question. Uh, but we could do a whole show on it sometime. Sure. I think um, you're probably right. Why? Because, or, again, I apologize for this in advance, but the whole thing about Cyrus being the Messiah of the Jews and why Cyrus rebuilt the Temple of Solomon, okay, when he relocated, when he let the Jews of Babylon who had been in captivity move back home. Of course, a lot of them stayed back in Babylon. And by the way, do you know what the Jews who stayed back in, behind in Babylon at the capital of the Persian Empire did instead of returning to Israel? They ran the banking system. Oh. The Persian emperor set up the first banking system of the world with standardized coinage. They invented checks. Checks were invented by the Persian emperor, specifically by Darius the Great. Wow. And the, the Jews were involved in the Babylonian banking system under the Persian Empire. And anyway, um, long story short, I make an argument in Iranian Leviathan in a chapter that I playfully, I playfully titled this chapter, uh, Tekel Tekel Manishekel. Yeah, that's from Daniel. Yeah. Well, it's a play on the words in Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, tekel, tekel, many shekel. Because see, the shekel, shekel means image in Persian. Oh. It means face. And it was specifically referring to the face of Darius on the coins called Darix. And so the word for, you know, money uh, in Hebrew comes from the image of Darius the Great on Persian coinage. In any case, I'm getting diverted. Yeah. Um, the whole business of Cyrus the Great and the creation of the second temple and the uh, relocation of the Jews, their, their, uh, you know, their odyssey back home to Israel. Okay. And the writing of the Hebrew Bible, as we know it today, which dates back to that time under Cyrus and Cambyses. Yeah. The whole thing was a Persian plot. 
I make an argument for this in Iranian Leviathan. Second Temple Judaism is a creation of an Illuminati elite who were Mithraists in the Persian Empire. And the transformations that we see inside Judaism, which are extensive at that time, that involve notions like punishment in hell, right. the individual soul, the coming apocalypse. I mean, all these ideas that you don't find at all in ancient Israelite religion. They are social engineering mechanisms that were specifically introduced into Judaism by Mithraic I don't even want to call them priests, Mithraic social engineers uh, who had a much wider agenda in terms of creating a new world order is what they were really after. And the banking system was part of that new world order, but a transformation in religion was also part of that new world order. And so the Cyrus, Cyrus was not a Zoroastrian. Cyrus was a Mithraist. I'd make an argument for this. And the guy who he appointed to be responsible for the Second Temple Project and the relocation of the Jews was a man named Mithradates, which means Mithra's justice. Right. He oversaw the whole Second Temple Project. Yeah. So I would not be at all surprised if they brought here Canians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Israel. There was two of them with that name, too. And that's when baptism becomes a thing in Judaism, too, at that time. So it all, it all just makes sense. And the last thing I'm going to say is I'm, I'm going to blow some people's minds with this. I want to get your opinion. And then we can finish off. You can tie it all together. Last thing I want to say is this, because the, that movement continues up until the time of Pompey and Caesar. So the same year, or well, I should say before that Crassus tries to go into Parthia, fails, gets killed. Pompey the Great sacks the Temple of Jerusalem. And there's a big, uh, it's, that's a big deal. Because now the priesthood that is held by the Persians is now in the hands of, guess what? The same year, 63 BC, that Pompey sacks Jerusalem is the same year they hold an election and, and, and Julius Caesar becomes the high priest of the entire Roman Empire, Pontifus Maximus, same title as Pope right now, by the way. Guess who else, guess what else happens that year? Cicero is consul and Augustus is born, baby Augustus, and, they're, and uh, the writers of, what's his name? I can't remember the guy's name who wrote this. But anyway, it's passed down through like Tacitus and Suetonius. They're all they're all talking about this. It's, this is widespread. You can go look this up. It's public knowledge. There was a supposedly a, a star in the sky it said any male that'll be born this year will be the king of the world. So they're basically saying Augustus is like a messiah. Anyways, long story short, let's fast forward a little bit. Julius Caesar gets killed. Julius Caesar had plans to go east. He had plans to do it. He wanted to, Alexander the Great was his god basically. He wanted to be the next Alexander the Great. But he couldn't do it. Mark Antony also wanted to do the same thing. But he ends up battling with Augustus. Now, the question is, why didn't Augustus do it? Augustus had all the, all the, all the stars were aligned for Augustus to go east and do what Alexander the Great did. I'll tell you why. Nicholas of Damascus tells us why. The, the, um, the king of India, Porus, same name as the king of, under Alexander the Great, just coincidentally, he sends delegates, Brahmin delegates, to go meet with Augustus and they bring him tigers and lions and oils and fragments and all these exotic presents and money and basically make a deal. And it's, it, and the reason why I bring all this up is because right after this happens, oh, by the way, um, one of the delegates goes with Augustus to Eleusius to get initiated in these rites. And after he's, he, apparently he saw something when he drank, he drank, drank the Kaikion, had the experience. Apparently, he saw something that changed his life. He jumped into a fire after that and killed himself because he no longer had anything else to live for. He, his life was complete. He wanted to die at that moment. That's re recorded in Nicholas of Damascus. Anyway, the reason why I brought all that up is because right after this, Augustus dedicates 72 temples across the, across the empire, and a lot of them were Mithra temples. And he becomes obsessed with the fire of Vesta. No, no, don't let the fire of Vesta go out. And all of a sudden, Mithraism is a boom in the Roman Empire. So I, I don't think it's a – and I think that's what happened. I think they're – I think he – something changed his mind with these delegates. And all of a sudden, Eastern religions were, were, were the hit. Christianity was not even that long after that. What do you that's think about very that? interesting. That's a fascinating story, which I hadn't heard before. But it makes a hell of a lot of sense to me uh, because, as we discussed in the previous show we did on Mithraism, the Parthians – 
had, I mean, of course, you know, Parthia was the main rival of Rome. That was Iran in the time of, of the Roman Empire. And so he would have had to march against the Parthians. And like we discussed in the previous show we did together, the Parthians had extensive agents operating in the seats of power in the Roman Empire. Um, and among the aristocracy in particular, uh, they, would, they would infiltrate through the port cities um, using the Cilician pirates. Uh, and so I could well imagine that what you're saying um, was some kind of a Parthian plot where they decided to use Indians as emissaries because the Parthians had a lot of influence in North. They, they basically were trying to turn North, um, North, you know, Northwestern India was a vassal state of, the, of one or another Iranian empire for almost all of its history. And the Parthians were trying to establish the same relationship with that part of India. So it's quite possible that the Indian emissaries that were sent there, you know, the Parthians knew Romans aren't going to listen to us. And if right. we send, you know, but we can send these Indians and they can basically do a PSYOP on these Romans uh, and, you know, get them not to invade Parthia, you know. And uh, so who knows? That makes a lot of sense in, in that wider context of psychological warfare between right. Parthia and uh, Rome. Yeah. And uh, if you want to, and if, I think we've covered a lot of ground. We can do this for hours. But if you want to give it, you know, anything else you want to say, tying everything together, or if you, if you want to just promote your books or anything, and we'll finish off. Well, the only book I would say, which I already pointed out, I mean, a lot of these uh, subjects we've discussed are in Iranian Leviathan. I mean, that's really my major treatment of Zarathustra. Um, although there's a, a bit about uh, Zarathustra, in particular, in relation to Gnosticism in this book as well, a novel folklore. Uh, I get into certain Gnostic teachings, um, in particular Manichaeism and uh, the ways in which it develops Zoroastrian ideas. Um, but, you know, I had been thinking to go on to a discussion of modern Gnosticism, but I see in retrospect that we could do a whole show on that subject um, because, you see, Zarathustra is rediscovered in the modern period, in the 1700s, by linguists. Darmester um, and others who translate the Zen of Vesta for the first time into European languages. Uh, and then you've got people like Hegel and Nietzsche reading these texts in German translation. Uh, and Zarathustra then becomes very important for modern, in, in, yeah. you know, um, like early modern European culture uh, to the point where you have Zarathustra become the mouthpiece for Nietzsche uh, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra and, you know, Richard Strauss naming ultimately, uh, you know, orchestral piece after Zarathustra, Mozart, in Mozart's Magic Flute, uh, he appears as Zarastro. So there's this whole revival of Zarathustra. Voltaire uh, refers to Zarathustra as the religious prophet most suitable to the ideals of the Age of Enlightenment. Yeah. He does calls him Zoroaster, of course. Does Carl um, Jung have anything to do with, because I know he revamps Gnosticism in his own way, big time. I'm sure uh, Zarathustra is mentioned in Jung. Of course, um, Jung engages with Nietzsche. Yeah. So, you know, via Nietzsche, you know, he engages with Zarathustra. Uh, but Jungian psychology is so deeply indebted yeah. to the ideas that Plato absorbed from Zarathustra, in particular, you know, the archetypes. Right? Yeah, that's a good point. Right? So... Um, and the, the aspects of Jung that are often referred to as Gnostic, when people say, call Jung a Gnostic, those are really Zarathustrian, not to say Zoroastrian, but they go back to Zarathustra because, see, Jung is not a dualist. There's a lot of aspects of Jungian thought that, are, that don't fit various facets of Gnosticism. Um, and the, the aspects of Jung that are Gnostic are the ones that Gnosticism shares in common with Zarathustra's teaching are really has inherited from Zarathustra's teaching. Okay, so that that's uh, that's a thing because interesting. in the Red Book he even talks about this whole battle between Satan and Christ, and nobody wins, and ends up being like this giant explosion where Abraxas comes out, and he's like the embodiment of all. He's he's everything. Like he is, you can't escape Abraxas. He's basically the one. The mo he didn't say that, but that's basically what he's. You know, getting at is that that's very similar to Zorvanite ideas, and I know at some point you wanted to discuss. There yeah, we should get into that next. Zorvanism. So you know, I'm I'm envisioning another program we do together that's focused on 
what Eric Vogelin calls modern Gnosticism. In other words, the Gnosticism of the period of like Hegel and Nietzsche and, you know, uh, even August Comte and so forth, um, the age of enlightenment, right, uh, going into the 19th century. A Gnosticism in that context and the rediscovery of Zarathustra in that context, right? And um, that could be a context for also engaging with Zorvanism uh, because people said that, for example, Adler referred to Nietzsche as a Zorvanist uh, Parsi without really knowing it, that, that Nietzsche's take on Zarathustra was basically the type of interpretation and adaptation of um, Zarathustra that we see in the ancient Zorvanites. Uh, so yeah, we could have a whole program on that. And I look forward to continuing the conversation there. Well, uh, guys, leave in the comments what you guys thought about all this. And if you want to add anything to the conversation, I will read them. And uh, we will do this again in the near future. And you have just attained true gnosis.